Okay, uh, coming to the contents, we are going to learn a little about the craniofacial embryology. I'm not going to go into depth uh, into what craniofacial embryology is because embryology is something that you have already studied. And I will not go in depth into craniofacial embryology because, uh, you know, one or two lectures won't be enough if I start talking about embryology. So I'm just going to give a brief idea on what embryology is. Mechanism of bone growth. Uh, what is postnatal craniofacial growth? Okay and growth rotations and growth in adults so coming to the first part introduction first definition what is growth or what or how you can define growth <clears throat> so growth can be defined as an increase in size now an increase in size was a single definition which was given but that did not complete the definition because if you just grow in size it won't be enough there should be some amount of changes taking place so not only size but change so they uh, recoiled the definition and they mentioned a new uh, definition for it that is growth may be defined as an increase in size by natural development and is a consequence of cellular proliferation and differentiation so you have both proliferation and differentiations of cells taking place during growth as the size increases so why is growth so important uh, for orthodontics okay now, to tell you the truth, the base of orthodontics starts with growth. So, if you uh, if you want to treat a child, okay, or if you want to know how much the person has grown, you have to know what is the uh, growth stage of that particular person. Age is just a number. You can just say, okay, some people say we can identify by age of the patient. Yes, but if you look at the new uh, stages of development in children, the children tend to mature at much faster rate than what was 10 years before. Okay, so uh, we have to know what is the growth potential that is left in the child or in the patient before we start any treatment. So an understanding of craniofacial development and growth is essential for one accurate diagnosis and treatment planning of even the most straightforward cases of malocclusion. Meaning even if it's a simple case of malocclusion, you have to know the uh, do the proper diagnosis and treatment planning. So growth spurt or growth uh, potential of the patient is important. So we should know the growth potential as majority of the orthodontic treatment is still performed on growing individuals that is children. So we tell them catch them early, catch them early in the sense we can correct any sort of malocclusion or any developing malocclusion or stop any malocclusion if we know the growth potential of the child. So I think Dr. Abdulaziz has already talked to you about preventive, interceptive, surgical, okay, orthodontics. So uh, preventive and interceptive is where we have growth as one of the uh, major parts. Corrective and surgical orthodontics is a post stage, I would say. Okay, but interception and uh, preventive is, you know, if you know the growth potential, you can uh, correct those kinds of occlusion at these two stages once you have crossed the stage then it's kind of you know an adult treatment plan and when it comes to an adult treatment plan you might have to do for go for surgery or you might have to go for functional therapy and a surgery along with orthodontics so uh, we do not know uh, how much complicated the case is depending on the comp depending on the severity of the case we have to decide the plan but if you know the growth uh, stage of the patient and if you can identify that there is still growth left, then we can treat them early. So growth can affect the severity of malocclusion. It can improve or worsen the growth as growth continues. The progress and outcome of orthodontic treatment. So if your patient is a growing child and you're doing orthodontic treatment, you have to uh, think ahead of how much the maxilla will grow and how much the mandible will grow. So you have to know the growth rotation of the mandible, the growth of the mandible, and how much the maxilla tends to grow along with your cranial base. <clears throat> so uh, this in turn would affect your orthodontic treatment result because if you do not uh, manage the amount of growth left in the child, your treatment can go into a malocclusion rather than correcting the malocclusion. Okay. Stability of orthodontic treatment results. As I said, if you finished your treatment at an early stage and growth is still left, the mandible, which is the last bone to grow and continues to grow, till the age of 18 to 21 at that particular point of time you will not be able to control the mandibular growth so it is important 
and it will affect the stability of orthodontic treatment. That means you have already corrected to a class one occlusion, good overjet, good overbite, and suddenly the mandible starts growing, you will end up with a class three or a edge to edge bite. So that is why growth is important. So orthodontic treatment may also have an effect on the facial growth. So remember that if you try to manipulate one bone, the whole face is affected. Why is the question? Because everything is interconnected. All the bones on your head and your face and your mouth, everything is interconnected. So any one bone that you touch will in turn affect the growth of the other bones. So what is craniofacial growth? Craniofacial growth can be defined as a complex process involving many interactions between the different bones that make up the skull and between the hard and soft tissues. So not only the bones surrounding it, but also the hard and soft, sorry, the soft tissues along with it. So all those muscle attachments, everything plays an important role in craniofacial growth or development of your face. Okay, that was just the basic definition of what craniofacial growth and what growth is all about. Now coming to the craniofacial embryology, as I said, I'm not going to go into depth on craniofacial embryology, but you need to know in uh, simple terms on what is neural crust cells and uh, what are these neural crusts uh, in the body uh, function as, okay? So neural crust cells are nothing but a temporary group of cells which arise from the ectoderm uh, germ layer, okay? And the unique part of these neural crust cells are that they can uh, differentiate into different cells which will have different functions in your body. That means they can change themselves into different parts of your body. Okay, they can be the heart, the lungs, the liver, anything. So neural crest cells are sort of unique cells which have the ability to migrate and form different kinds of cells. Okay, so, and they are they are derived from the ectoderm germ layer. I'm keeping it simple. I'm not going into a depth of embryology. As I told you, because I'm going to talk about embryology, this lecture won't finish even if, if I take the whole month of embryology uh, lecture, it won't finish. So I wouldn't go in depth because you have already finished embryology in your previous uh, classes. So basic idea, that's it. I'm sorry. Um, so what is the importance? So basic knowledge of craniofacial embryology is important for all dental practitioners, that's including you, but more important for the orthodontist. Why? As it gives an insight into the future craniofacial growth and possible causes of developmental anomalies of the craniofacial region. So this helps us or gives us an idea on how the face is going to grow and if there are any anomalies that we have to tackle in the future. So this is why it is very important as far as an orthodontist is concerned. As a general dentist is concerned, it is important but not as important as it is for the orthodontist. Okay, so it is an ectomesenchymal tissue arising from the neural fold and is considered a separate germ layer that is capable of forming many different cell types and which is highly migratory. So that's what I told. They are capable of producing different types of cells or differentiating in different types of cells and they can travel from one point to the other and they can form different parts of your body. A cranial neural crust cell from different regions, that's the rhombomeres, that's the transiently divided segments of the developing neural tube within the hindbrain region. Of the developing hindbrain, migrate to specific areas and neural crest derivatives are pre-specified. That means they are already coded. There's a certain coding inside each of these cells. And that coding tells them what it has to form. So some of the derivatives, I can uh, you can see in the chart there, cartilage, bone, uh, Merkel's cartilage, underblast, country tissues, okay, derma of the face and neck, tendons, a lot of things are from melanocytes, okay. So what is the main reason for this coding or what helps these cells to differentiate? So what is that? The patterning of neural crust derivatives is controlled by genes. What are these genes called? They are called Hox genes or homeobox genes, okay. So Hox genes contain a, a conserved DNA sequence, okay, that's called the homeobox. So they have a particular sequence in them which tells them what it has to form. So this collection of uh, the Hox genes which contain the DNA sequence is called the homeobox, okay. So you have to just remember the terms, you don't have to go into depth of what these things are. 
and understand that these cells are responsible for the development of different parts of your body. Okay, coming to pharyngeal arches. Now you know there are pouches and arches. Okay, and each arch is important to us. Now why is each arch important to us? Because it forms different parts of your body. As far as the dentist is concerned, okay, the first and the second arch is the most important. Okay, the third, fourth, fifth arches are not much of importance to us. So, the sixth arch, sorry, six arches. So, out of that, the first two are the most important. Now, the arches are separated by pharyngeal grooves or clefts externally and pouches internally. And each arch consists of a central cartilage rod. That means it has a cartilage formation area that forms a skeleton, okay, and is derived from the neural crest. A muscular component with muscle cells in it formed from mesoderm and the fascia and the tendons from the neural crest cells. See, all of them are from the neural crest cells. A vascular component and a nervous element. So there is blood supply elements and nervous elements, which includes both the sensory and the special visceral motor fibers from the cranial nerve, which supplies the, the mucosa and the muscles of the face. Okay, so all these are there in the pharyngeal arches. And that is why these arches are very important. So what is the first arch? What does it contain? And what is the second arch? What does it contain? The first arch is called your mandibular arch. Okay. And the second arch is called your hyoid arch. Now I'll tell you why. Okay. Around the fourth week of intrauterine life, the pharyngeal arches are laid down. The first arch is called your mandibular arch. The second one is called your hyoid arch. Okay. Now what are the derivatives? All these derivatives are important as far as you are concerned, as a dentist is concerned. Okay, what are the muscles of the first arch? What are the nerves of the first arch? And what all skeletons are formed from the first arch? Similarly, for the second arches. So all your muscles of facial, like uh, your muscles of mastication, you might have heard anterior digastric, tensile palatine, tensile tympani are formed from the first arch. And the nerves, the trigeminal nerve, maxillary and mandibular division is formed from your first arch. All the facial bones, including Incus and malleus. Now, incus and malleus are bones of the ears. There are three bones for the ears, incus, malleus, and stapes. But stapes is formed from your second arch. Only the incus and malleus are formed from the first arch. The sphenomandibular ligament and the mandible. And this is why it is called the mandibular arch. Okay, so we have the mandible there. Remember, it's much easier. First arch, mandible derivative, mandibular arch. Second arch, you'll see the muscles of facial expression, posterior digastric, the stapedius thylohyoid, and the Levator with palatine. Okay. The facial nerve and the skeletons, as I told you, stapes, styloid process, styloid ligament, lesser horn, and upper part of the body of the hyoid. And this is why it's called the hyoid arch. Remember the hyoid bone, second arch, hyoid arch. So it's much easier to remember these terminologies rather than trying to find out. Now I'm going to show you uh, certain terminologies that we'll be using throughout the session. Something like cranial towards the head or superior towards the head caudal towards the leg or inferior towards the leg. Okay, we have uh, your other, just a sec. Is it visible? Am I, is, is the screen visible? It is. Okay, great, fine. Okay, so Coming to the different, okay. So we have, as I told you, cranial or caudal, superior uh, and inferior, okay. Now the other things are anterior and posterior. Anterior means towards the front. It's also known as ventral. Posterior is towards the back, meaning dorsal. Okay, now we can also say superior to be proximal and inferior to be distal. So you will come across these terminologies as you go in to your, uh, you know, into your chapter. So I will be coming across different terminologies. I might use superior sometimes, I might use inferior sometimes, I might use caudal sometimes. Okay, I might use ventral or dorsal. So you shouldn't get confused, right? That was the uh, part of your embryology and your pharyngeal arches and why those arches are important. Okay, coming to your facial development. At the end of facial development, uh, and two more slides, I will stop this lecture. And we will continue the postnatal growth uh, and the prenatal growth side by side in the next lecture. So what is facial development? 
now the face how does it develop and what is the different parts for facial development so this is all uh, during the prenatal stages not the postnatal stages okay. development of the face begins at the end of the fourth week iu or intrauterine there are five prominences the maxillary swelling which is towards the lateral the mandibular swelling which is towards the caudal okay the frontonasal swelling which is more rostral that's more upwards so maxillary swelling mandibular swelling frontonasal swelling there are three swellings now why is it called five then there are two maxillary swellings two mandibular swellings and one frontonasal swelling that's why it is five swellings okay there are two maxillary two mandibular and one frontonasal now what happens during each uh, day or each month of the iu or intrauterine life that is 24 to 28 days what happens the maxillary swellings they enlarge they grow ventrally okay forward and medially they grow more forward and towards the midline medially okay a pair of ectodermal thickenings called the nasal placards appear on the frontonasal process and begin to enlarge so on the frontonasal process remember the frontonasal process is your future forehead so the forehead and the face they are connected right now so what happens is uh, there is something called as nasal placards okay which form during this particular period that's from 24 to 28 days okay and they become big so they enlarge from 28 to 32 days what happens the ectoderm at the center of each nasal placards that means the center portion of these nasal placards they invaginate what is invagination invagination means to sink to sink down to form a pit okay and this invagination or pitting will give rise to something called as your nasal pit now nasal pit is nothing but your formation of your nose taking place there okay nasal pits the oval shaped holes that you see right now okay that is being formed the nasal pit and dividing the raised rim of the placard into lateral nasal process and medial nasal process so now what happens when it forms like a pit it divides into two halves the medial portion is called towards the midline is called the medial nasal process towards the side towards the lateral side is called the lateral nasal process okay 32 to 35 days the medial nasal processes migrate towards each other and they fuse they merge the middle portion that is uh, let me see if i can get yeah this portion fuses the middle portion fuses the mandibular swellings have already merged so the future mandible is already being formed there the dark blue one this one right okay the nasal placards they deepen and fuse to form a single enlarged ectodermal nasal sac now your nose is being actually being formed here so that is why the pits are deepening and they form a enlarged sac so 40 to 48 days what happens lateral and inferior expansion okay the lateral and the inferior expansion of the medial nasal processes to form the intermaxillary process now remember the intermaxillary process is what you see here okay i'm going to take that out because if i keep it there you won't be able to see it yeah so okay there so we have the intermaxillary process being formed remember this is one of the most important stages of your uh, face formation because it's giving rise to your maxilla the first part of your maxilla that's why it's called intermaxillary process the tip of the maxillary swellings grows to meet the this particular process the intermaxillary process and gives rise to the bridge and septum of your nose now it's dividing your nose into two halves okay so seven to ten weeks the ectoderm and the mesoderm of the frontonasal process and the intermaxillary process proliferate forming a midline nasal septum and this divides the nasal cavity into two passages which open behind the pharynx at the secondary palate area okay coming back to that other picture 
Now, along with this intermaxillary process, we have formation of your philtrum. What is philtrum? Philtrum is the upper portion of your lip. Okay, philtrum of your lip. And it is formed by merging of the maxillary process in front of the intermaxillary process. So, 7 to 10 weeks, we have both the frontal nasal process and intermaxillary process forming to form a middle, middle nasal septum, dividing the nose into two cavities. And we have formation of the philtrum of the upper lip. And what else? The lateral portion of the maxillary and mandibular swellings merge together. So maxillary swelling and mandibular swelling, they fuse together and forms your cheek. Okay, and this reduces your mouth into its final width. So coming to that again. So this Need to get a pen here. Okay, this process and this process, axillary and mandibular process, they fuse together, and they form your cheeks. So, this portion of your mouth attains its final width during this period. That's seven to ten weeks. So, again, in short, seven to ten weeks. Important stage: the midline nasal septum is formed, nose is divided into two cavities, philtrum is formed, and your cheeks are formed. Okay, formation of your palate. At the beginning of your seventh week IU, the floor of the nasal cavity, okay, is the posterior extension of your intermaxillary process known as primary palate. So this is what I said. The intermaxillary process is one of the most important stages because most of the things of your face starts to get completed at this particular period. So seventh week IU, the, the floor of the nasal cavity, which is formed, is nothing but the posterior extension of your intermaxillary process, which is your primary palate. Okay, the floor is formed by the primary palate from your intermaxillary process. Intermaxillary process, okay, so it's an important stage there. So during the seventh week, the medial walls of the maxillary swelling begin to produce a pair of medial extensions called palatal shells. Let me come to the next picture there. Okay, so let me get my pen again. This is your nasal septum, the one that I've marked there first. Okay. These are your palatine shells. Okay. These are your palatine shells. Now, what are these palatine shells? Again, the medial wall of your maxillary swellings, the medial wall, the middle wall of your maxillary swellings, they produce extensions downwards, middle, medial extensions downwards. And these are palatine shells which grow inferiorly on either sides of your tongue. So the T here marked here is your tongue. This T marked here is your tongue. And these things which I've marked as X are your palatine shells. Now they grow on either sides of your tongue. Okay. Now what's the surprising part of this? When your tongue moves downwards, these palatine shells, they elevate upwards. That's your second picture here. That's your second picture here. The shells have elevated upwards. Sorry. Yeah, the shells have elevated upwards. So as the tongue moves downwards, the palatine shells rotate upwards and towards the midline, growing horizontally during the eight week IU. And the palatine shells begin to fuse ventro dorsally, front and back. They fuse with each other. And the primary palate and the inferior border of the nasal septum by the ninth week. So your full palate is formed by your ninth week along with your floor of your nasal cavity. Okay, that's how your palate is formed. So till now, I was just talking about your development of your face and your palate. Now coming to what is the actual mechanism of bone growth. Now we're going to start with pre and post together. You, you should be able to correlate it with each other. Okay, so there are mainly two types of bone growth in our body. Okay, there are two types of ossification processes. So what is ossification? The process by which new mineralized bone is formed is called ossification. Now it occurs in two ways. One is called intramembranous ossification or bone formation. And the second one is called endochondral ossification or bone formation. Now what is the difference between the intramembranous bone formation or ossification or 
endochondral bone formation or ossification what's the difference how are they different from each other now remember intramembranous bone formation or ossification is seen during the embryonic development by direct transformation of your mesenchymal cells into osteoblasts what are osteoblasts osteoblasts are cells that are responsible for bone deposition okay so what happens is that the mesenchymal cells which are there okay they transform into osteoblasts and osteoblasts they form osteogenic membrane okay like bone sheet and intramembranous ossification is seen in bones of calvaria facial bone mandible and clavicle now you will be asking me what is calvaria calvaria is nothing but the top portion of your head the skull the top portion is called the calvaria the base is called the cranial base so it's two different things calvaria is the top portion the facial bones the mandible and clavicle are formed by intramembranous ossification okay i hope this is clear the calvaria the facial bones the mandible and the clavicle are formed by intramembranous formation so that means there is direct deposition of bone by transformation of mesenchymal cells into osteoblasts and osteoblasts lay down the bone directly on to the surface forming these bones so what is endochondral ossification endochondral the name itself chondral means cartilage so endochondral ossification is seen in long bones of your limbs axial skeleton and the bones of the cranial base so remember except the cranial base all the other parts of your head and face are formed by intramembranous ossification but your cranial base is formed by endochondral ossification along with your long bones and axial skeleton now ossification takes place in a hyaline cartilage framework hyaline cartilage so first the cartilage is formed then ossification takes around this cartilage and begins in the region known as the primary ossification center so it forms the primary ossification center in the hyaline cartilage where the ossification takes place around the cartilage and ossification spreads from the primary ossification center to different areas at the growth center the chondroblasts okay chondroblasts are aligned in columns along with the direction of growth in which there are zones of cell division cell hypertrophy and calcification so this process is seen in both epiphyseal plates of long bones and synchondrosis of your cranial base i will come in detail to what synchondrosis of your cranial base is but for now just understand that you will see endochondral bone formation in these particular areas that is your axial skeleton long bones and cranial base okay what is synchondrosis as i said i i'll come back to it i said so synchondrosis resembles two epiphyseal cartilage plates placed back to back and have common central zone of resting cells it's like a sandwich to be simple if you have a sandwich you have some sort of cheese or cream in between just like that synchondrosis resembles two epiphyseal cartilage placed back to back and having a common central zone of resting cells okay so it's a, a bone with central cell zone sandwiched in between so they have two directions of linear growth that means the growth tendency of this particular synchondrosis is linear in pattern so it goes sorry i have a lot of people leaving the session i think it's very boring <laughs> okay so it has two patterns of growth okay one in this direction and the other in this direction so linear pattern of growth in opposite direction and this is why there is expansion of this particular bone so the bone is actually increasing in size when it grows in two different directions so they have two directions of linear growth in response to and non functional stimuli and the bones on either sides of synchondrosis are moved apart as it grows now what is the synchondrosis if you can understand this particular thing here can anyone tell me what this is what i have drawn here or marked on top of this picture in with the arrows anyone 
it's called the pituitary fossa that's where your pituitary gland is it's also called as the cella tersica okay cranial base so it's also called the cella tersica that's where your pituitary gland stays okay so at birth there are three synchondroses in the cranial base the most important is your sphene occipital synchondroses that is this one okay so you will see that there are different bones there the ethmoid the frontal the sphenoid and the occipital so the between the sphenoid and the occipital bone is your sphene occipital synchondroses and that is the last part of your it's a cartilage so it's a last part of the cartilage which uh, in your cranial base ossifies at the last part, uh, sorry at the um, at a very later stage of growth uh, nearly uh, 13 to 15 in females and um, around 17 years in males so i'll come to that as we uh, talk about your cranial base okay so uh, yeah that's that in synchondroses i'll come in detail to synchondroses again don't worry about it so how does the overall bone growth take place now if i ask someone how does bone grow they tell me doctor grows by remodeling what is remodeling remodeling is nothing but deposition and resorption of bone okay deposition and resorption of bone if one side the bone gets deposited the other side it gets resorbed this is to maintain the architecture of your bone and second by displacement or transposition displacement or transposition so growth does not consist simply of enlargement of bone by deposition but also periosteal remodeling okay which is needed to maintain the overall shape of the bone and grow endosteal remodeling to maintain the inter internal architecture of your cortical plates and your trabeculae so along with remodeling displacement or transposition there is also periosteal and endosteal remodeling now what do you mean by displacement or transposition and what is drift i already told you remodeling means uh deposition and resorption of bone together forms remodeling coming to the next one what is drift before i go to transposition or displacement let me tell you what drift is it's nothing but change in position of a bone owing to remodeling of that structure is called a drift so for example if if i tell you the plus signs here on the maxilla the plus signs here on the maxilla okay is showing bone deposition on your maxilla okay and when bone deposits here what happens to the maxilla the maxilla starts moving in a forward and downward direction now not growing only moves uh not exactly it is movement because of growth of that particular bone so i'm giving you the maxilla as the example and because of the growth of the maxilla at the posterior portion of the maxilla where is attached to the cranial base you can see these plus signs here because of deposition of bone in this area the maxilla tends to grow in a downward and forward direction so no it tends to move in a downward and forward direction because the bone is getting deposited here you cannot say the maxilla grows downwards but it moves downwards and forwards but growth is taking place upwards and backwards okay because the deposition is in the opposite direction but the movement is in forward and downward direction now drift is because of the the own growth the, the bones its own growth okay deposition of the bone at its posterior po, 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 sorry posterior position tends to push the maxilla downwards thus you can call that the maxilla drifted downwards because of its own growth then what do you mean by displacement now let me explain that displacement to you i told you your synchondroses has linear growth okay one direction like this and the other direction in the opposite side so when this grows can you see this is where your synchondroses is this portion okay when there is growth in this region and there is growth in this region it tends to push this in this direction and this in the opposite direction so what will happen when the cranial base grows when there is a growth at the cranial base at the synchondroses region okay as it enlarges it tends to push your maxilla downwards so the maxilla is displaced by growth of your cranial 
base. Because of the growth of the cranial base, the maxilla is pushed downwards. These are two different terminologies. They are not the same. Remember, drift and displacement. I have given the same example because I don't want you to get confused. Maxilla, by its own growth, at the posterior region, is pushed downwards and forwards. Okay, that is called drift. And because of the cranio, because of the, the synchondrosis growth at the cranial base or the cranial base growth, the maxilla is pushed forwards and downwards. Now the maxilla is displaced when the cranial base grows. It is not drift. So don't confuse between the two terminologies. They are two different things. They are not the same. Okay, I think this would be the last slide or second last slide. Uh, postnatal craniofacial growth. I'll start with this and I will go in detail about the postnatal growth in the next lecture. So postnatal growth, uh, we have to know something called as growth pattern. What is a growth pattern? Growth pattern is nothing but telling you that different tissues in your body has different rates of growth or different timing of growth. Okay. And what are these types? What are these uh, tissues or what are these different types of tissues in the body? They are neural tissues, somatic, genital and lymphoid. Now, genital and lymphoid, not of much importance to us. It's more on the medical side, but the neural and somatic is important to us. Neural is more concerned with the brain growth. Somatic is more concerned with the body growth. Okay. And your maxilla and mandible falls in between the neural and the somatic growth. Maxilla more towards the neural growth, that means more towards the brain growth and the mandible more towards the somatic or body growth. Okay, the first two are most relevant terms in craniofacial growth, that is neural and somatic. The neural growth is essentially that which is determined by the growth of the brain with the calvarium following its pattern. I told you the top portion of your skull following this pattern. There is a rapid growth in the early stages of life, but it slows down to seven years. Okay. And by seven years, almost growth is complete. The orbit also follows your neural pattern of growth. So what is somatic growth? Growth is that which is followed by all the other structures of your body. The brain is only the neural part. Okay. And the maxilla is more towards your brain. The calvary is more towards the brain. The uh, mandible and the rest of the uh, parts of the uh, bone are more towards the somatic growth. Okay. So it is seen in the long bones amongst others and in patterns followed by increase in body height. So long bones, that's what they mean. Okay, growth is fairly rapid in early years, but slows in pre-pubertal period. Now, there are different stages of puberty. Pre-pubertal stage, pubertal stage and post-pubertal stage. And all these stages are important for growth determination as far as an orthodontist or a dentist is concerned. Why? Because you're in a dental clinic. If you know the pre-pubertal, the pubertal and the post-pubertal stages, you can advise the patient for orthodontic treatment. You can advise them, but you cannot treat them. You can advise. Them. Okay. So what is pubertal growth period? Your pre-pubertal is before your, uh, you know, seven years, there is a rapid growth. Then it stops. That's why when you see your young, uh, if you have a baby in the house, okay, and your sister or, you know, someone is really young or just, they were just delivered. You'll see that they tend to grow very fast. Over the year, like seven years and all, they, they are like, you know, fully uh, a rapid stage of growth. And after seven years, you'll see that the growth is slow. Okay. Then after a few years, so around 12 years in girls and 14 years in boys, you'll see another shoot up of growth. Suddenly you'll see your kid brother, your kid sister is much taller than you when they're 12 and 14. Okay. So this is called pubertal growth. And post pubertal is after the puberty has uh, concluded or finished. Again, post pubertal growth spurt, there is very minimal growth left. And what is most important for us is the pubertal growth period or the pubertal growth spurt. Now, what is a spurt? Now, you'll be asking me, I'm telling you about spurt, spurt. What is spurt? Spurt means rapid onset. Okay. Spurt means a rapid onset, like sudden curve or sudden push or sudden growth. Here, growth spurt, so rapid onset of growth. That is called a spurt. Okay, pre-pubertal growth spurts in girls uh, are usually seen at 12 years and for boys it's 14 years and this is the time where you have to do any sort of growth modifications that is twin block appliance, myofunctional appliances, all your myofunctional 
actuator, bionator, twin block, frankels. Okay, all are given during this stage. Yes, you can give fixed functional appliances also, including your face mask, headgear, all those stuffs are given during your pubertal growth spurt. Fixed functional appliances by the author, they say that it's more towards your post pubertal growth where you need to actually push. But yes, you can use them during the pubertal growth spurt as well. Okay, the maxilla and mandible follow a pattern of growth that is intermediate between neural and somatic, that is between your neural and somatic. The mandible with more somatic growth curve and maxilla, which is more neural growth pattern. As I said before, what I was explaining. Okay, so with this, I will stop my lecture and all this next topics, your calvarium, your maxilla, mandible, everything I will take up in the next lecture. Okay, for now, I'll stop here. If you have any doubts, please feel free to ask me during the uh, the lecture, uh, the sessions, practical sessions. Okay, if you have any anything that you